Chapter 30 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Fourth of Public Wrongs by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Chapter the Thirtieth of Reversal of Judgment. We are next to consider how judgments with their several connected consequences of attainder, forfeiture, and corruption of blood may be set aside. There are two ways of doing this, either by falsifying or reversing the judgment, or else by reprieve or pardon. A judgment may be falsified, reversed, or voided in the first place without a writ of error for matters foreign to or dehors the record, that is, not apparent upon the face of it, so that they cannot be assigned for error in the superior court, which can only judge from what appears in the record itself. And therefore, if the whole record be not certified or not truly certified by the inferior court, the party injured thereby, in both civil and criminal cases, may allege a diminution of the record and cause it to be rectified. Thus, if any judgment whatever be given by persons who had no good commission to proceed against the person condemned, it is void, and may be falsified by showing the special matter without writ of error. As where a commission issues to A and B and twelve others, or any two of them, of which A or B shall be one, to take and try indictments, and any of the other twelve proceed without the interposition or presence of either A or B. In this case, all proceedings, trials, convictions, and judgments are void for want of a proper authority in the commissioners, and may be falsified upon bare inspection without the trouble of a writ of error, it being a high misdemeanor in the judges so proceeding, and little, if anything, short of murder in them all, in case the person so attainted be executed and suffer death. So likewise, if a man purchases land of another, and afterwards the vendor is, either by outlawry or his own confession, convicted and attainted of treason or felony previous to the sale or alienation, whereby such land becomes liable to forfeiture or a shet, now upon any trial the purchaser is at liberty without bringing any writ of error to falsify not only the time of the felony or treason supposed but the very point of the felony or treason itself and is not concluded by the confession or the outlawry of the vendor though the vendor himself is concluded and not suffered now to deny the fact which he has by confession or flight acknowledged but if such attainder of the vendor was by verdict on the oath of his peers, the alienee cannot be received to falsify or contradict the fact of the crime committed, though he is at liberty to prove a mistake in time or that the offense was committed after the alienation and not before. Secondly, a judgment may be reversed by writ of error, which lies from all inferior criminal jurisdictions to the Court of King's Bench and from the King's Bench to the House of Peers, and it may be brought for notorious mistakes in the judgment or other parts of the record, as where a man is found guilty of perjury and receives the judgment of felony, or for other less palpable errors, such as any irregularity, omission, or want of form in the process of outlawry or proclamations, the want of a proper addition to the defendant's name according to the statute of additions for not properly naming the sheriff or other officer of the court, or not duly describing where his county court was held, for laying an offense committed in the time of the late king to be done against the peace of the present, and for many other similar causes which, though allowed out of tenderness to life and liberty, are not much to the credit or advancement of the national justice. These writs of error to reverse judgments in case of misdemeanors are not to be allowed of course but on sufficient probable cause shown to the Attorney General, and then they are understood to be grantable of common right and ex debito justiciae. 
but writs of error to reverse attainders in capital cases are only allowed ex gratia and not without express warrant under the king's signed manual or at least by the consent of the attorney general these therefore can rarely be brought by the party himself especially where he is attainted for an offence against the state but they may be brought by his heir or executor after his death in more favourable times which may be some consolation to his family but the easier and more effectual way is lastly to reverse the attainder by act of parliament this may be and hath been frequently done upon motives of compassion or perhaps the zeal of the times after a sudden revolution in the government without examining too closely into the truth or validity of the errors assigned and sometimes though the crime be universally acknowledged and confessed yet the merits of the criminal's family shall after his death obtain a restitution in blood honours and estate or some or one of them by act of parliament which so far as it extends has all the effect of reversing the attainder without casting any reflections upon the justice of the preceding sentence the effect of falsifying or reversing an outlawry is that the party shall be in the same plight as if he had appeared upon the copyist, and if it be before the plea pleaded, he shall be put to plead the indictment, if after conviction, he shall receive the sentence of the law. For all the other proceedings except only the process of outlawry for his non-appearance remain good and effectual as before but when judgment pronounced upon conviction is falsified or reversed all former proceedings are absolutely set aside and the party stands as if he had never been at all accused restored in his credit his capacity his blood and his estates with regard to which last though they be granted away by the crown yet the owner may enter upon the grantee with as little ceremony as he might enter upon a deceaser but he still remains liable to another prosecution for the same offence for the first being erroneous he never was in jeopardy thereby end of chapter the thirtieth chapter thirty one of the commentaries on the laws of england book the fourth of public wrongs by william blackstone this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Chapter the 31st of Reprieve and Pardon. The only other remaining ways of avoiding the execution of the judgment are by a reprieve or a pardon, whereof the former is temporary only, the latter permanent. 1 a reprieve from reprende to take back is the withdrawing of a sentence for an interval of time whereby the execution is suspended this may be first ex arbitrio judicis either before or after judgment as where the judge is not satisfied with the verdict or the evidence is suspicious or the indictment is insufficient or he is doubtful whether the offence be within clergy or sometimes if it be a small felony or any favourable circumstances appear in the criminal's character in order to give room to apply to the crown for either an absolute or conditional pardon these arbitrary reprieves may be granted or taken off by the justices of jail delivery although their session be finished and their commission expired but this rather by common usage than of strict right reprieves may also be ex necessitate legis as where a woman is capitally convicted and pleads her pregnancy though this is no cause to stay the judgment yet it is to respite the execution till she be delivered this is a mercy dictated by the law of nature in favorum prolis and therefore no part of the bloody proceedings in the reign of queen mary hath been more justly detested than the cruelty that was exercised in the island of guernsey of burning a woman big with child 
and when, through the violence of the flames, the infant sprang forth at the stake and was preserved by the bystanders, after some deliberation of the priests who assisted at the sacrifice, they cast it again into the fire as a young heretic, a barbarity which they never learned from the laws of ancient Rome, which direct with the same humanity as our own, quod praegnantes mulieres damnatae poena deferator, quod pariet, which doctrine has also prevailed in England as early as the first memorials of our law will reach. In case this plea be made in stay of execution, the judge must direct a jury of twelve matrons or discreet women to inquire the fact, and if they bring in their verdict, quick with child, for barely with child, unless it be alive in the womb, is not sufficient, execution shall be stayed generally till the next session, and so from session to session till either she is delivered or proves by the course of nature not to have been with child at all. But if she once hath had the benefit of this reprieve and been delivered, and afterwards becomes pregnant again, she shall not be entitled to the benefit of a farther respite for that cause. For she may now be executed before the child is quick in the womb, and shall not, by her own incontinence, evade the sentence of justice. Another cause of regular reprieve is, if the offender become non compos between the judgment and the award of execution. For regularly, as was formerly observed, though a man be compost when he commits a capital crime, yet if he becomes non compost after, he shall not be indicted. If after indictment, he shall not be convicted. If after conviction, he shall not receive judgment. If after judgment, he shall not be ordered for execution. For furioso solo furare punitor and the law knows not, but he might have offered some reason in his senses to have stayed these respective proceedings. It is therefore an invariable rule when any time intervenes between the attainder and the award of execution to demand of the prisoner what he hath to allege why execution should not be awarded against him. And if he appears to be insane, the judge in his discretion may and ought to reprieve him or the party may plead in bar of execution, which plea may be either pregnancy, the king's pardon, an act of grace, or diversity of person, viz. that he is not the same that was attainted, and the like. In this last case, a jury shall be impaneled to try this collateral issue, namely, the identity of his person, and not whether guilty or innocent, for that has been decided before. And in these collateral issues the trial shall be instanter, and no time allowed the prisoner to make his defense or produce his witnesses unless he will make oath that he is not the person attainted. Neither shall any peremptory challenges of the jury be allowed to the prisoner, though formerly such challenges were held to be allowable whenever a man's life was in question. 2. If neither pregnancy, insanity, non-identity, nor other plea will avail to avoid the judgment and stay the execution consequent thereupon, the last and surest resort is in the king's most gracious pardon, the granting of which is the most amiable prerogative of the crown. Laws, says an able writer, cannot be framed on principles of compassion to guilt, yet justice, by the Constitution of England, is bound to be administered in mercy. This is promised by the king in his coronation oath, and it is that act of his government which is the most personal and most entirely his own. The king himself condemns no man, that rugged task he leaves to his courts of justice, the great operation of his scepter, is mercy. His power of pardoning was said by our Saxon ancestors to be derived a lege sue dignitatis, and it is declared in Parliament by Statute 27 Henry VIII c. 24 that no other person hath power to pardon or remit any treason or felonies whatsoever, but that the king hath the whole and sole power thereof united and knit to the imperial crown of this realm. 
This is indeed one of the great advantages of monarchy in general above any other form of government, that there is a magistrate who has it in his power to extend mercy wherever he thinks it is deserved, holding a court of equity in his own breast to soften the rigor of the general law in such criminal cases as merit an exemption from punishment. Pardons, according to some theorists, should be excluded in a perfect legislation where punishments are mild but certain, for the clemency of the prince seems a tacit disapprobation of the laws. But the exclusion of pardons must necessarily introduce a very dangerous power in the judge or jury, that of construing the criminal law by the spirit instead of the letter, or else it must be holden what no man will seriously avow, that the situation and circumstances of the offender, though they alter not the essence of the crime, ought to make no distinction in the punishment. In democracies, however, this power of pardon can never subsist, for there nothing higher is acknowledged than the magistrate who administers the laws, and it would be impolitic for the power of judging and of pardoning to center in one and the same person. This, as the President Montesquieu observes, would oblige him very often to contradict himself, to make and to unmake his decisions, it would tend to confound all the ideas of right among the mass of the people, as they would find it difficult to tell whether a prisoner were discharged by his innocence or obtained a pardon through favor. In Holland, therefore, if there be no stadholder, there is no power of pardoning lodged in any other member of the state. But in monarchies, the king acts in a superior sphere, and though he regulates the whole government as the first mover, yet he does not appear in any of the disagreeable or invidious parts of it. Whenever the nation see him personally engaged, it is only in the works of legislature, magnificence, or compassion. To him, therefore, the people look up as the fountain of nothing but bounty and grace, and these repeated acts of goodness, coming immediately from his own hand, endear the sovereign to his subjects, and contribute more than anything to root in their hearts that filial affection and personal loyalty, which are the sure establishment of a prince. Under this head of pardons, let us briefly consider, 1. The object of pardon. 2. The manner of pardoning, three, the method of allowing a pardon, or the effect of such pardon when allowed. One, and first, the king may pardon all offenses merely against the crown or the public, excepting one, that to preserve the liberty of the subject, the committing any man to prison out of the realm is by the habeas corpus act. 31 Charles II C2 made a primunary unpardonable even by the king. Nor, too, can the king pardon where private justice is principally concerned in the prosecution of offenders. Non potest rex gratium saccare cum ignoria et damno aliorum. Therefore, in appeals of all kinds which are the suit not of the king but of the party injured, the prosecutor may release, but the king cannot pardon. Neither can he pardon a common nuisance while it remains unredressed, or so as to prevent an abatement of it, though afterwards he may remit the fine, because though the prosecution is vested in the king to avoid multiplicity of suits, yet, during its continuance, this offense favors more of the nature of a private injury to each individual in the neighborhood than of a public wrong. Neither, lastly, can the king pardon an offense against the popular or penal statute after the information brought, for thereby the informer hath acquired a private property in his part of the penalty. There is also a restriction of a peculiar nature that affects the prerogative of pardoning in case of parliamentary impeachments, viz., that the king's pardon cannot be pleaded to any such impeachment so as to impede the inquiry and stop the prosecution of great and notorious offenders. Therefore, when in the reign of Charles II the Earl of Danby was impeached by the House of Commons of high treason and other misdemeanors, and pleaded the king's pardon in bar of the same, the Commons alleged 
that there was no precedent that ever any pardon was granted to any person impeached by the commons of high treason or other high crimes depending the impeachment, and therefore resolved that the pardon so pleaded was illegal and void, and ought not to be allowed in bar of the impeachment of the commons of England, for which resolution they assigned this reason to the House of Lords that the setting up a pardon to be a bar of an impeachment defeats the whole use and effect of impeachments. For should this point be admitted or stand doubted, it would totally discourage the exhibiting any for the future, whereby the chief institution for the preservation of the government would be destroyed. Soon after the revolution, the commons renewed the same claim and voted that a pardon is not pleadable in bar of an impeachment. And at length, it was enacted by the Act of Settlement, 12 and 13, William III, C. 2, that no pardon under the Great Seal of England shall be pleadable to an impeachment by the Commons in Parliament. But after the impeachment has been solemnly heard and determined, it is not understood that the King's royal grace is farther restrained or abridged. For after the impeachment and attainder of the six rebel lords in 1715, three of them were from time to time reprieved by the crown and at length received the benefit of the king's most gracious pardon. 2. As to the manner of pardoning, it is a general rule that wherever it may be reasonably presumed the king is deceived, the pardon is void. Therefore, any suppression of truth or suggestion of falsehood in a charter of pardon will vitiate the whole, for the king was misinformed. General words have also a very imperfect effect in pardons. A pardon of all felonies will not pardon a conviction or attainder of felony, for it is presumed the king knew not of those proceedings, but the conviction or attainder must be particularly mentioned and a pardon of felonies will not include piracy, for that is no felony punishable at the common law. It is also enacted by Statute 13 Richard II, St. 2, C. 1, that no pardon for treason, murder, or rape shall be allowed unless the offense be particularly specified therein, and particularly in murder it shall be expressed whether it was committed by lying in wait, assault, or malice prepense upon which Sir Edward Coke observes that it was not the intention of the Parliament that the King should ever pardon murder under these aggravations, and therefore they prudently laid the pardon under these restrictions because they did not conceive it possible that the King would ever excuse an offense by name which was attended with such high aggravations. And it is remarkable enough that there is no precedent of a pardon in the register for any other homicide than that which happens, se defendendo, or per infortunium, to which two species the king's pardon was expressly confined by the statutes 2 Edward III c. 2 and 14 Edward III c. 15, which declare that no pardon of homicide shall be granted, but only where the king may do it by the oath of his crown, that is to say, where a man slayeth another in his own defense or by misfortune. But the statute of Richard II before mentioned enlarges by implication the royal power, provided the king is not deceived in the intended object of his mercy. And therefore, pardons of murder were always granted with a non obstante of the statute of King Richard till the time of the revolution. When the doctrine of non obstante ceasing, it was doubted whether murder could be pardoned generally, but it was determined by the court of King's Bench that the king may pardon on an indictment of murder, as well as a subject may discharge an appeal. Under these and a few other restrictions, it is a general rule that a pardon shall be taken most beneficially for the subject and most strongly against the king. A pardon may be also conditional, that is, the king may extend his mercy upon what terms he pleases, and may annex to his bounty a condition either precedent or subsequent on the performance whereof the validity of the pardon will depend, and this by the common law. 
which prerogative is daily exerted in the pardon of felons on condition of transportation to some foreign country, usually to some of His Majesty's colonies and plantations in America, for life or for a term of years, such transportation or banishment being allowable and warranted by the Habeas Corpus Act, 31 Charles II C2 S14 and rendered more easy and effectual by statute 8 George III C15. 3. With regard to the manner of allowing pardons, we may observe that a pardon by act of Parliament is more beneficial than by the King's Charter. For a man is not bound to plead it, but the court must ex officio take notice of it. Neither can he lose the benefit of it by his own latches or negligence, as he may of the King's Charter of Pardon. The King's Charter of Pardon must be specially pleaded, and that at a proper time. For if a man is indicted and has a pardon in his pocket, and afterwards puts himself upon his trial by pleading the general issue, he has waived the benefit of such pardon. But if a man avails himself thereof as soon as by course of law he may, a pardon may either be pleaded upon arraignment or in arrest of judgment, or in the present stage of proceedings in bar of execution. Anciently, by statute 10 Edward III C2, no pardon of felony could be allowed unless the party found sureties for the good behavior before the sheriff and coroners of the county. But that statute is repealed by the statute 5 and 6, William and Mary, C13, which instead thereof gives the judges of the court a discretionary power to bind the criminal pleading such pardon to his good behavior with two sureties for any term not exceeding seven years. 4. Lastly, the effect of such pardon by the king is to make the offender a new man to acquit him of all corporal penalties and forfeitures annexed to that offense for which he obtains his pardon, and not so much to restore his former as to give him a new credit and capacity. But nothing can restore or purify the blood when once corrupted if the pardon be not allowed till after attainder but the high and transcendent power of Parliament. Yet if a person attainted receives the king's pardon and afterwards hath a son, that son may be heir to his father, because the father, being made a new man, might transmit new inheritable blood, though had he been born before the pardon, he could never have inherited at all. End of chapter the 31st Chapter 32 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England Book the Fourth of Public Wrongs by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Chapter the Thirty Second of Execution. There now remains nothing to speak of but execution, the completion of human punishment. And this, in all cases, as well capital as otherwise, must be performed by the legal officer, the sheriff, or his deputy, whose warrant for so doing was anciently by precept under the hand and seal of the judge, as it is still practiced in the court of the Lord High Steward upon the execution of a peer, though in the court of the peers in Parliament it is done by writ from the king. Afterwards, it was established that in case of life, the judge may command execution to be done without any writ, and now the usage is for the judge to sign the calendar or list all the prisoners' names with their separate judgments in the margin which is left with the sheriff. As, for a capital felony, it is written opposite to the prisoner's name, let him be hanged by the neck. Formerly, in the days of Latin and abbreviation, sus per cal for suspendator per column. And this is the only warrant that the sheriff has for so material an act as taking away the life of another. 
it may certainly afford matter of speculation that in civil causes there should be such a variety of writs of execution to recover a trifling debt issued in the king's name under the seal of the court, without which the sheriff cannot legally stir one step, and yet that the execution of a man, the most important and terrible task of any, should depend upon a marginal note. The sheriff, upon receipt of his warrant, is to do execution within a convenient time, which in the country is also left at large. In London, indeed, a more solemn and becoming exactness is used, both as to the warrant of execution and the time of executing thereof. For the recorder, after reporting to the king in person the case of the several prisoners, and receiving his royal pleasure, that the law must take its course, issues his warrant to the sheriffs, directing them to do execution on the day and at the place assigned. And in the court of King's Bench, if the prisoner be tried at the bar, or brought there by habeas corpus, a rule is made for his execution, either specifying the time and place, or leaving it to the discretion of the sheriff. And throughout the kingdom, by statute 25 George II, C. 37, it is enacted that, in case of murder, the judge shall in his sentence direct execution to be performed on the next day but one after sentence passed. But otherwise, the time and place of execution are by law no part of the judgment. It has been well observed that it is of great importance that the punishment should follow the crime as early as possible, that the prospect of gratification or advantage which tempts a man to commit the crime should instantly awake the attendant idea of punishment. The lay of execution serves only to separate these ideas, and then the execution itself affects the minds of the spectators rather as a terrible sight than as the necessary consequence of transgression. The sheriff cannot alter the manner of the execution by substituting one death for another without being guilty of felony himself, as has been formerly said. It is held also by Sir Edward Coke and Sir Matthew Hale that even the king cannot change the punishment of the law by altering the hanging or burning into beheading, though when beheading is part of the sentence the king may remit the rest. And notwithstanding some examples to the contrary, Sir Edward Coke stoutly maintains that judicandum est legibus non exemplis. But others have thought, and more justly, that this prerogative, being founded in mercy and immemorially exercised by the crown, is part of the common law. For hitherto, in every instance, all these exchanges have been for more merciful kinds of death, and how far this may also fall within the king's power of granting conditional pardons, viz., by remitting a severe kind of death on condition that the criminal submits to a milder, is a matter that may bear consideration. It is observable that when Lord Stafford was executed for the Popish plot in the reign of King Charles the Second, the then sheriffs of London, having received the king's writ for beheading him, petitioned the House of Lords for a command or order from their lordships how the said judgment should be executed. For he being prosecuted by impeachment, they entertained the notion, which is said to have been countenanced by Lord Russell, that the king could not pardon any part of the sentence. The lords resolved that the scruples of the sheriffs were unnecessary and declared that the king's writ ought to be obeyed. Disappointed of raising a flame in that assembly, they immediately signified to the House of Commons by one of the members that they were not satisfied as to the power of the said writ. The House took two days to consider of it, and then sullenly resolved that the House was content that the Sheriff do execute Lord Stafford by severing his head from his body. It is farther related that when afterwards the same Lord Russell was condemned for high treason upon indictment, the king, while he remitted the ignominious part of the sentence, observed that his lordship would now find he was possessed of that prerogative, which in the case of Lord Stafford he had denied him. One can hardly determine at this distance from those turbulent times 
which most to disapprove of the indecent and sanguinary zeal of the subject or the cool and cruel sarcasm of the sovereign. To conclude, it is clear that if upon judgment to be hanged by the neck till he is dead, the criminal be not thoroughly killed, but revives, the sheriff must hang him again. For the former hanging was no execution of the sentence, and if a false tenderness were to be indulged in such cases, a multitude of collusions might ensue. Nay, even while abjurations were in force, such a criminal so reviving was not allowed to take sanctuary and abjure the realm, but his fleeing to sanctuary was held an escape in the officer. And having thus arrived at the last stage of criminal proceedings or execution, the end and completion of human punishment, which was the sixth and last head to be considered under the division of public wrongs, the fourth and last object of the laws of England, it may now seem high time to put a period to these commentaries, which the author is very sensible have already swelled to too great a length. But he cannot dismiss the student, for whose use alone these rudiments were originally compiled, without endeavoring to recall to his memory some principal outlines of the legal constitution of this country, by a short historical review of the most considerable revolutions that have happened in the laws of England from the earliest to the present times. And this talk he will attempt to discharge, however imperfectly, in the next or concluding chapter. End of chapter the thirty second. Chapter thirty three, part one of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Fourth of Public Wrongs by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Chapter the 33rd of The Rise, Progress, and Gradual Improvements of the Laws of England, Part 1. Before we enter on the subject of this chapter, in which I propose, by way of supplement to the whole, to attempt an historical review of the most remarkable changes and alterations that have happened in the laws of England, I must first of all remind the student that the rise and progress of many principal points and doctrines have already been pointed out in the course of these commentaries under their respective divisions. These having therefore been particularly discussed already, it cannot be expected that I should re-examine them with any degree of minuteness which would be a most tedious undertaking. What I therefore at present propose is only to mark out some outlines of an English judicial history by taking a chronological view of the state of our laws and their successive mutations at different periods of time. The several periods under which I shall consider the state of our legal polity are the following six. 1. From the earliest times to the Norman Conquest. 2. From the Norman Conquest to the reign of King Edward I. 3. From thence to the Reformation. 4. From the Reformation to the Restoration of King Charles II. 5. From thence to the Revolution in 1688. 6. From the Revolution to the Present Time. 1. And first, with regard to the ancient Britons, the Aborigines of our island, we have so little handed down to us concerning them with any tolerable certainty that our inquiries here must needs be very fruitless and defective. However, from Caesar's account of the tenets and discipline of the ancient Druids in Gaul, in whom centered all the learning of these western parts, and who were, as he tells us, sent over to Britain, that is, to the island of Mona and Anglesey, to be instructed, we may collect a few points which bear a great affinity and resemblance to some of the modern doctrines of our English law, particularly the very notion itself of an oral unwritten law delivered down from age to age by custom and tradition merely seems derived from the practice of the Druids who never committed any of their instructions to writing, 
possibly for want of letters, since it is remarkable that in all the antiquities, unquestionably British, which the industry of the moderns has discovered, there is not in any of them the least trace of any character or letter to be found. The partible quality also of lands, by the custom of gavel kind, which still obtains in many parts of England, and did universally over Wales till the reign of Henry the Eighth, is undoubtedly of British original. So likewise is the ancient division of the goods of an intestate between his widow and children, or next of kin, which has since been revived by the statute of distributions. And we may also remember an instance of a slighter nature mentioned in the present volume, where the same custom has continued from Caesar's time to the present, that of burning a woman guilty of the crime of petite treason by killing her husband. The great variety of nations that successively broke in upon and destroyed both the British inhabitants and constitution, the Romans, the Picts, and after them, the various clans of Saxons and Danes, must necessarily have caused great confusion and uncertainty in the laws and antiquities of the kingdom, as they were very soon incorporated and blended together, and therefore we may suppose mutually communicated to each other their respective uses in regard to the rights of property and the punishment of crimes, so that it is morally impossible to trace out with any degree of accuracy when the several mutations of the common law were made or what was the respective original of those several customs we at present use by any chemical resolution of them to their first and component principles. We can seldom pronounce that this custom was derived from the Britons, that was left behind by the Romans, this was a necessary precaution against the Picts, that was introduced by the Saxons, discontinued by the Danes, but afterwards restored by the Normans. Wherever this can be done, it is a matter of great curiosity and some use, but this can very rarely be the case, not only from the reason above mentioned, but also from many others. First, from the nature of traditional laws in general, which being accommodated to the exigencies of the times, suffer by degrees insensible variations in practice, so that though upon comparison we plainly discern the alteration of the law from what it was five hundred years ago, yet it is impossible to define the precise period in which that alteration accrued any more than we can discern the changes of the bed of a river which varies its shores by continual decreases and alluvions. Secondly, this becomes impracticable from the antiquity of the kingdom and its government, which alone, though it had been disturbed by no foreign invasions, would make it an impossible thing to search out the original of its laws, unless we had as authentic monuments thereof as the Jews had by the hand of Moses. Thirdly, this uncertainty of the true origin of particular customs must also, in part, have arisen from the means whereby Christianity was propagated among our Saxon ancestors in this island, by learned foreigners brought over from Rome and other countries who undoubtedly carried with them many of their own national customs and probably prevailed upon the state to abrogate such usages as were inconsistent with our holy religion and to introduce many others that were more conformable thereto. And this perhaps may have partly been the cause that we find not only some rules of the mosaical, but also of the imperial and pontifical laws blended and adopted into our own system. A farther reason may also be given for the great variety and, of course, the uncertain original of our ancient established customs even after the Saxon government was firmly established in this island, viz., the subdivision of the kingdom into an heptarchy consisting of seven independent kingdoms peopled and governed by different clans and colonies. This must necessarily create an infinite diversity of laws, even though all those colonies of Jutes, Angles, proper Saxons, and the like originally sprung from the same mother country, the great northern hive, which poured forth its warlike progeny and swarmed all over Europe in the 6th and 7th centuries. 
This multiplicity of laws will necessarily be the case in some degree where any kingdom is cantoned out into provincial establishments and not under one common dispensation of laws, though under the same sovereign power. Much more will it happen where seven unconnected states are to form their own constitution and superstructure of government, though they all begin to build upon the same or similar foundations. When, therefore, the West Saxons had swallowed up all the rest, and King Alfred succeeded to the monarchy of England, whereof his grandfather Egbert was the founder, his mighty genius prompted him to undertake a most great and necessary work, which he is said to have executed in as masterly a manner. No less than to new model the Constitution, to rebuild it on a plan that should endure for ages, and out of its old discordant materials, which were heaped upon each other in a vast root irregularity, to form one uniform and well-connected whole. This he effected by reducing the whole kingdom under one regular and gradual subordination of government, wherein each man was answerable to his immediate superior for his own conduct and that of his nearest neighbors, for to him we owe that masterpiece of judicial polity, the subdivision of England, into tithings and hundreds, if not into counties, all under the influence and administration of one supreme magistrate, the king, in whom, as in a general reservoir, all the executive authority of the law was lodged, and from whom justice was dispersed to every part of the nation by distinct yet communicating ducts and channels, which wise institution has been preserved for near a thousand years unchanged from Alfred's to the present time. He also, like another, Theodosius, connected the various customs that he found dispersed in the kingdom and reduced and digested them into one universal system or code of laws in his Dombek or Liber Judicalis. This he compiled for the use of the court baron, hundred, and county court, the court leet, and sheriff's turn. Tribunals which he established for the trial of all causes civil and criminal in the very districts wherein the complaint arose all of them subject, however, to be inspected, controlled, and kept within the bounds of the universal or common law by the king's own courts, which were then itinerant, being kept in the king's palace and removing with his household in those royal progresses which he continually made from one end of the kingdom to the other. The Danish invasion and conquest which introduced new foreign customs was a severe blow to this noble fabric, but a plan so excellently concerted could never be long thrown aside, so that upon the expulsion of these intruders the English returned to their ancient law, retaining, however, some few of the customs of their late visitants, which went under the name of Danelaga, as the code compiled by Alfred was called the West Saxon Laga, and the local constitutions of the ancient kingdom of Mercia, which obtained in the counties nearest to Wales and probably abounded with many British customs, were called the Mersin Laga. And these three laws were, about the beginning of the 11th century, in use in different counties of the realm, the provincial polity of counties and their subdivisions having never been altered or discontinued through all the shocks and mutations of government from the time of its first institution, though the laws and customs therein used have, as we shall see, often suffered considerable changes. For King Edgar, who besides his military merit as founder of the English navy was also a most excellent civil governor, observing the ill effects of three distinct bodies of law prevailing at once in separate parts of his dominions, projected and begun what his grandson King Edward the Confessor afterwards completed, viz. one uniform digest or body of laws to be observed throughout the whole kingdom, being probably no more than a revival of King Alfred's code, with some improvements suggested by necessity and experience, particularly the incorporating some of the British, or rather Mercian customs, and also such of the Danish as were reasonable and approved into the West Saxon Laga, which was still the groundwork of the whole. And this appears to me to be the best supported and most plausible conjecture, 
for certainty is not to be expected of the rise and original of that admirable system of maxims and unwritten customs which is now known by the name of the common law as extending its authority universally over all the realm and which is doubtless of Saxon parentage. Among the most remarkable of the Saxon laws we may reckon, one, the constitution of parliaments, or rather, general assemblies of the principal and wisest men in the nation, the Wittenagemot, or commune concilium of the ancient Germans, which was not yet reduced to the forms and distinctions of our modern parliament, without whose concurrence, however, no new laws could be made or old one altered. Two, the election of their magistrates by the people, originally even that of their kings, till dear-bought experience evinced the convenience and necessity of establishing an hereditary succession to the crown. But that of all subordinate magistrates, their military officers or heretics, their sheriffs, their conservators of the peace, their coroners, their port reeves, since changed into mayors and bailiffs, and even their tithingmen or boars holders at the leet continued some till the Norman conquest, others for two centuries after, and some remain to this day. 3. The descent of the crown, when once a royal family was established upon nearly the same hereditary principles upon which it has ever since continued, only that perhaps, in case of minority, the next of kin of full age would ascend to the throne as king and not as protector, though after his death the crown immediately reverted back to the heir. 4. The great paucity of capital punishments for the first offense, even the most notorious offenders being allowed to commute it for a fine or wear guild, or, in default of payment, perpetual bondage, to which our benefit of clergy has now in some measure succeeded. 5. The prevalence of certain customs as heriots and military service in proportion to every man's land, which much resembled the feudal constitution, but were exempt from all its rigorous hardships, and which may be well enough accounted for by supposing them to be brought from the continent by the first Saxon invaders in the primitive moderation and simplicity of the feudal law, before it got into the hands of the Norman jurists who extracted the most slavish doctrines and oppressive consequences out of what was originally intended as a law of liberty. 6. That their estates were liable to forfeiture for treason, but that the doctrine of eschets and corruption of blood for felony or any other cause was utterly unknown amongst them. 7. The descent of their lands was to all males equally, without any right of primogeniture. A custom which obtained among the Britons was agreeable to the Roman law and continued among the Saxons till the Norman conquest, though really inconvenient and more especially destructive to ancient families which are in monarchies necessary to be supported in order to form and keep up a nobility or intermediate state between the prince and the common people. 8. The courts of justice consisted principally of the county courts, and in cases of weight or nicety, the king's court held before himself in person at the time of his parliaments, which were usually holding in different places according as he kept the three great festivals of Christmas, Easter, and Whitsuntide. An institution which was adopted by King Alonso VII of Castile about a century after the conquest, who at the same three great feasts was wont to assemble his nobility and prelates in his court, who there heard and decided all controversies, and then, having received his instructions, departed home. These county courts, however, differed from the modern ones in that the ecclesiastical and civil jurisdiction were blended together, the bishop and the elderman or sheriff sitting in the same county court, and also that the decisions and proceedings therein were much more simple and unembarrassed, an advantage which will always attend the infancy of any laws but wear off as they gradually advance to antiquity. 9. Trials, among a people who had a very strong tincture of superstition, were permitted to be by ordeal, by the coarse ned or morsel of execration, 
or by wager of law with compurgators if the party chose it, but frequently they were also by jury, for whether or no their juries consisted precisely of twelve men or were bound to a strict unanimity, yet the general constitution of this admirable criterion of truth and most important guardian both of public and private liberty we owe to our Saxon ancestors. Thus stood the general frame of our polity at the time of the Norman invasion when the second period of our legal history commences. End of chapter the 33rd, part 1. Chapter 33, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Fourth of Public Wrongs by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Chapter the 33rd of the Rise, Progress, and Gradual Improvements of the Laws of England. Part 2. 2. This remarkable event wrought as great an alteration in our laws as it did in our ancient line of kings, and though the alteration of the former was effected rather by the consent of the people than any right of conquest, yet that consent seems to have been partly extorted by fear and partly given without any apprehension of the consequences which afterwards ensued. 1. Among the first of these alterations we may reckon the separation of the ecclesiastical courts from the civil, effected in order to ingratiate the new king with the popish clergy, who for some time before had been endeavoring all over Europe to exempt themselves from the secular power, and whose demands the conqueror, like a politic prince, thought it prudent to comply with, by reason that their reputed sanctity had a great influence over the minds of the people, and because all the little learning of the times was engrossed into their hands, which made them necessary men, and by all means to be gained over to his interests. And this was the more easily effected, because the disposal of all the episcopal sees being then in the breast of the king, he had taken care to fill them with Italian and Norman prelates. 2. Another violent alteration of the English constitution consisted in the depopulation of whole countries for the purposes of the king's royal diversion, and subjecting both them and all the ancient forests of the kingdom to the unreasonable severities of forest laws imported from the continent, whereby the slaughter of a beast was made almost as penal as the death of a man. In the Saxon times, though no man was allowed to kill or chase the king's deer, yet he might start any game, pursue and kill it upon his own estate. But the rigor of these new constitutions vested the sole property of all the game in England in the king alone, and no man was entitled to disturb any fowl of the air or any beast of the field of such kinds as were specially reserved for the royal amusement of the sovereign without express license from the king by a grant of a chase or free warren, and those franchises were granted as much with a view to preserve the breed of animals as to indulge the subject. From a similar principle to which, though the forest laws are now mitigated and by degrees grown entirely obsolete, yet from this root has sprung up a bastard slip known by the name of the game law, now arrived to and wantoning in its highest vigor, both founded upon the same unreasonable notions of permanent property in wild creatures, and both productive of the same tyranny to the commons, but with this difference, that the forest laws established only one mighty hunter throughout the land, the game laws have raised a little nimrod in every manner. And in one respect the ancient law was much less unreasonable than the modern, for the king's grantee of a chase or free warren might kill game in every part of his franchise, but now, though a freeholder of less than a hundred pounds a year is forbidden to kill a partridge upon his own estate, yet nobody else, not even the lord of the manor, unless he hath a grant of free warren, can do it without committing a trespass and subjecting himself to an action. 3. 
A third alteration in the English laws was by narrowing the remedial influence of the county courts, the great seats of Saxon justice, and extending the original jurisdiction of the king's justiciars to all kinds of causes arising in all parts of the kingdom. To this end, the Aula Regis, with all its multifarious authority, was erected, and a capital justiciary appointed with power so large and boundless that he became at length a tyrant to the people and formidable to the crown itself. The constitution of this court and the judges themselves who presided there were fetched from the Duchy of Normandy, and the consequence naturally was the ordaining that all proceedings in the king's courts should be carried on in the Norman instead of the English language, a provision the more necessary because none of his Norman justiciars understood English, but as evident a badge of slavery as ever was imposed upon a conquered people. This lasted till King Edward III obtained a double victory over the armies of France in their own country and their language in our courts here at home. But there was one mischief too deeply rooted thereby, and which this caution of King Edward came too late to eradicate. Instead of the plain and easy method of determining suits in the county courts, the chicanes and subtleties of Norman jurisprudence had taken possession of the king's courts to which every cause of consequence was drawn. Indeed, that age and those immediately succeeding it were the era of refinement and subtlety. There is an active principle in the human soul that will ever be exerting its faculties to the utmost stretch in whatever employment by the accidents of time and place, the general plan of education or the customs and manners of the age and country it may happen to find itself engaged. The northern conquerors of Europe were then emerging from the grossest ignorance in point of literature, and those who had leisure to cultivate its progress were such only as were cloistered in monasteries, the rest being all soldiers or peasants. And unfortunately, the first rudiments of science which they imbibed were those of Aristotle's philosophy conveyed through the medium of his Arabian commentators, which were brought from the east by the Saracens into Palestine and Spain and translated into barbarous Latin, so that though the materials upon which they were naturally employed in the infancy of a rising state were those of the noblest kind, the establishment of religion and the regulations of civil polity, yet, having only such tools to work with, their execution was trifling and flimsy. Both the divinity and the law of those times were therefore frittered into logical distinctions and drawn out into metaphysical subtleties with a skill most amazingly artificial, but which serves no other purpose than to show the vast powers of the human intellect, however vainly or preposterously employed. Hence, law in particular, which, being intended for universal reception, ought to be a plain rule of action, became a science of the greatest intricacy, especially when blended with new refinements engrafted upon feudal property, which refinements were from time to time gradually introduced by the Norman practitioners with a view to supersede, as they did in great measure, the more homely but more intelligible maxims of distributive justice among the Saxons. And to say the truth, these scholastic reformers have transmitted their dialect and finesses to posterity so interwoven in the body of our legal polity that they cannot now be taken out without a manifest injury to the substance. Statute after statute has in later times been made to pair off these troublesome execrances and restore the common law to its pristine simplicity and vigor, and the endeavor has greatly succeeded but still the scars are deep and visible, and the liberality of our modern courts of justice is frequently obliged to have recourse to unaccountable fictions and circuities in order to recover that equitable and substantial justice which for a long time was totally buried under the narrow rules and fanciful niceties of metaphysical and Norman jurisprudence. 4. A fourth innovation was the introduction of the trial by combat for the decision of all civil and criminal questions of fact in the last resort. 
This was the immemorial practice of all the northern nations, but first reduced to regular and stated forms among the Burgundi about the close of the 5th century, and from them it passed to other nations, particularly the Franks and the Normans, which last had the honor to establish it here, though clearly an unchristian as well as most uncertain method of trial. But it was a sufficient recommendation of it to the conqueror and his warlike countrymen that it was the usage of their native duchy of Normandy. 5. But the last and most important alteration, both in our civil and military polity, was the engrafting on all landed estates, a few only excepted, the fiction of feudal tenure, which drew after it a numerous and oppressive train of servile fruits and appendages, aids, reliefs, premier seasons, wardships, marriages, chets, and fines for alienation, the genuine consequences of the maxim then adopted, that all the lands in England were derived from and holden immediately or immediately of the crown. The nation at this period seems to have groaned under as absolute a slavery as was in the power of a warlike and ambitious and a politic prince to create. The consciences of men were enslaved by four ecclesiastics devoted to a foreign power and unconnected with the civil state under which they lived, who now imported from Rome for the first time the whole farrago of superstitious novelties which had been engendered by the blindness and corruption of the times between the first mission of Augustine the monk and the Norman conquest, such as transubstantiation, purgatory, communion in one kind, and the worship of saints and images, not forgetting the universal supremacy and dogmatic infallibility of the Holy See. The laws, too, as well as the prayers, were administered in an unknown tongue. The ancient trial by jury gave way to the impious decision by battle. The forest laws totally restrained all rural pleasures and manly recreations, and in cities and towns the case was no better, all company being obliged to disperse and fire and candle to be extinguished by eight at night at the sound of the melancholy curfew. The ultimate property of all lands and considerable share of the present profits were vested in the king or by him granted out to his Norman favorites, who, by a gradual progression of slavery, were absolute vassals to the crown and as absolute tyrants to the commons. Unheard of forfeitures, talliages, aids, and fines were arbitrarily extracted from the pillaged landholders in pursuance of the new system of tenure and to crown all as a consequence of the tenure by night service, the king had always ready at his command an army of 60,000 knights or millites who were bound upon pain of confiscating their estates to attend him in time of invasion or to quell any domestic insurrection. Trade or foreign merchandise, such as it then was, was carried on by the Jews and Lombards, and the very name of an English fleet, which King Edgar had rendered so formidable, was utterly unknown to Europe, the nation consisting wholly of the clergy, who were also the lawyers, the barons or great lords of the land, the knights or soldiery, who were the subordinate landholders, and the burghers or inferior tradesmen, who from their insignificancy happily retained in their sockage and burgage tenure some points of their ancient freedom. All the rest were villains or bondsmen. From so complete and well-concerted a scheme of servility, it has been the work of generations for our ancestors to redeem themselves and their posterity into that state of liberty which we now enjoy, and which therefore is not to be looked upon as consisting of mere encroachments on the crown and infringements of the prerogative, as some slavish and narrow-minded writers in the last century endeavored to maintain, but as, in general, a gradual restoration of that ancient constitution whereof our Saxon forefathers had been unjustly deprived, partly by the policy and partly by the force of the Norman. How that restoration has, in a long series of years, been step by step effected, I now proceed to inquire. William Rufus proceeded on his father's plan and in some points extended it 
particularly with regard to the forest laws, but his brother and successor, Henry I, found it expedient when first he came to the crown to ingratiate himself with the people by restoring, as our monkish historians tell us, the laws of King Edward the Confessor. The ground whereof is this, that by charter he gave up the great grievances of marriage, ward, and relief, the beneficial pecuniary fruits of his feudal tenures, but reserved the tenures themselves for the same military purposes that his father introduced them. He also abolished the curfew, for though it is mentioned in our laws a full century afterwards, yet it is rather spoken of as a known time of night, so denominated from that abrogated usage than as a still subsisting custom. There is extant a code of laws in his name, consisting partly of those of the confessor, but with great additions and alterations of his own, and chiefly calculated for the regulation of the county courts. It contains some directions as to crimes and their punishments, that of theft being made capital in his reign, and a few things relating to estates, particularly as to the descent of lands, which being by the Saxon laws equally to all the sons, by the feudal or Norman to the eldest only, King Henry here moderated the difference, directing the eldest son to have only the principal estate, Rimum Patris Fiudum, the rest of his estates, if he had any others, being equally divided among them all. On the other hand, he gave up to the clergy the free election of bishops and mitred abbots, reserving, however, these ensigns of patronage, conge des lire, custody of the temporalities when vacant, and homage upon their restitution. He lastly united again for a time the civil and ecclesiastical courts, which union was soon dissolved by his Norman clergy, and upon that final dissolution the cognizance of testamentary causes seems to have been first given to the ecclesiastical court. The rest remained as in his father's time, from whence we may easily perceive how far short this was of a thorough restitution of King Edward's or the Saxon laws. The usurper Stephen, as the manner of usurpers is, promised much at his accession, especially with regard to redressing the grievances of the forest laws, but performed no great manner either in that or in any other point. It is from his reign, however, that we are to date the introduction of the Roman civil and canon laws into this realm, and at the same time was imported the doctrine of appeals to the court of Rome as a branch of the canon law. By the time of King Henry II, if not earlier, the charter of Henry I seems to have been forgotten, for we find the claim of marriage, ward, and relief then flourishing in full vigor. The right of primogeniture also seems to have tacitly revived, being found more convenient for the public than the parceling of estates into a multitude of minute subdivisions. However, in this prince's reign, much was done to methodize the laws and reduce them into a regular order, as appears from that excellent treatise of Glanville, which, though some of it be now antiquated and altered, yet, when compared with the code of Henry I, it carries a manifest superiority. Throughout his reign also was continued the important struggle which we have had occasion so often to mention between the laws of England and Rome, the former supported by the strength of the temporal nobility when endeavored to be supplanted in favor of the latter by the popish clergy, which dispute was kept on foot till the reign of Edward I, when the laws of England, under the new discipline introduced by that skillful commander, obtained a complete and permanent victory. In the present reign of Henry II, there are four things which peculiarly merit the attention of the legal antiquarian. 1. The Constitutions of the Parliament at Clarendon, A.D. 1164, whereby the king checked the power of the pope and his clergy and greatly narrowed the total exemption they claimed from their secular jurisdiction, though his farther progress was unhappily stopped by the fatal event of the disputes between him and Archbishop Becket. 2. The institution of the Office of Justices in Ire, in Itinere, 
the king having divided the kingdom into six circuits, a little different from the present, and commissioned these new created judges to administer justice and try writs of assize in the several counties. These remedies are said to have been the first invented, before which all causes were usually terminated in the county courts according to the Saxon custom, or before the king's judiciaries in the Aula Regis in pursuance of the Norman regulations. The latter of which tribunals, traveling about with the king's person, occasioned intolerable expense and delay to the suitors, and the former, however proper, for little debts and minute actions, where even injustice is better than procrastination, were now become liable to too much ignorance of the law and too much partiality as to facts to determine matters of considerable moment. 3. The introduction and establishment of the grand assize or trial by a special kind of jury in a writ of right at the option of the tenant or defendant instead of the barbarous and Norman trial by battle. 4. To this time must also be referred the introduction of escuage or pecuniary compensation for personal military service, which in process of time was the parent of the ancient subsidies granted to the crown by Parliament and the land tax of later times. Richard I, a brave and magnanimous prince, was a sportsman as well as a soldier, and therefore enforced the forest laws with some rigor, which occasioned many discontents among his people, though, according to Matthew Paris, he repealed the penalties of castration, lost the vise, and cutting off of the hands and feet before inflicted on such as transgressed in the hunting, probably finding that their severity prevented prosecutions. He also, when abroad, composed a body of naval laws at the Isle of Oleron, which are still extant and of high authority, for in his time we began again to discover that, as an island, we were naturally a maritime power. But with regard to civil proceedings, we find nothing very remarkable in this reign except a few regulations regarding the Jews and the justices in ire, the king's thoughts being chiefly taken up by the knight errantry of a crusade against the Saracens in the Holy Land. In King John's time, and that of his son Henry III, the rigors of the feudal tenures and the forest laws were so warmly kept up that they occasioned many insurrections of the barons or principal feudatories, which at last had this effect, that first King John and afterwards his son consented to the two famous charters of English liberties, Magna Carta and Carta de Foresta. Of these, the latter was well calculated to redress many grievances and encroachments of the crown in the exertion of forest law and the former confirmed many liberties of the church and redressed many grievances incident to feudal tenures of no small moment at the time, though now, unless considered attentively and with this retrospect, they seem but of trifling concern. But besides these feudal provisions, care was also taken therein to protect the subject against other oppressions then frequently arising from unreasonable immersements from illegal distresses or other process for debts or services due the crown, and from the tyrannical abuse of the prerogative of purveyance and preemption. It fixed the forfeiture of lands for felony in the same manner as it still remains, prohibited for the future the grants of exclusive fisheries and the erection of new bridges so as to oppress the neighborhood. With respect to private rights, it established the testamentary power of the subject over part of his personal estate, the rest being distributed among his wife and children. It laid down the law of dower, as it hath continued ever since, and prohibited the appeals of women unless for the death of their husbands. In manners of public police and national concern, it enjoined an uniformity of weights and measures, gave new encouragements to commerce by protection of merchant strangers, and forbade the alienation of lands in Mortmain. With regard to the administration of justice, besides prohibiting all denials or delays of it, 
it fixed the Court of Common Pleas at Westminster that the suitors might no longer be harassed with following the king's person in all his progresses, and at the same time brought the trial of issues home to the very doors of the freeholders by directing assizes to be taken in the proper counties and establishing annual circuits. It also corrected some abuses then incident to the trials by wager of law and of battle, directed the regular awarding of inquests for life or member, prohibited the king's inferior ministers from holding pleas of the crown or trying any criminal charge whereby many forfeitures might otherwise have unjustly accrued to the exchequer, and regulated the time and place of holding the inferior tribunals of justice, the county court, the sheriff's torn, and the court leap. It confirmed and established the liberties of the City of London and all other cities, boroughs, towns, and ports of the kingdom. And lastly, which alone would have merited the title that it bears of the Great Charter, it protected every individual of the nation in the free enjoyment of his life, his liberty, and his property, unless declared to be forfeited by the judgment of his peers or the law of the land. However, by means of these struggles, the Pope in the reign of King John gained a still greater ascendant here than he had ever before enjoyed, which continued through the long reign of his son Henry III, in the beginning of whose time the old Saxon trial by ordeal was also totally abolished. And we may by this time perceive in Bracton's treatise a still farther improvement in the method and regularity of the common law, especially in the point of pleadings. Nor must it be forgotten that the first traces which remain of the separation of the greater barons from the less in the constitution of parliaments are found in the great charter of King John, though omitted in that of Henry the Third, and that, towards the end of the latter of these reigns, we find the first record of any writ for summoning knights, citizens, and burgesses to parliament. And here we conclude the second period of our English legal history. End of chapter the 33rd, part 2. Chapter 33, part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Fourth of Public Wrongs by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes Of the Rise, Progress, and Gradual Improvements of the Laws of England Part 3 3. The third commences with the reign of Edward I, who may justly be styled our English Justinian, for in his time the law did receive so sudden a perfection that Sir Matthew Hale does not scruple to affirm that more was done in the first thirteen years of his reign to settle and establish the distributive justice of the kingdom than in all the ages since that time put together. It would be endless to enumerate all the particulars of these regulations, but the principle may be reduced under the following general heads. One, he established, confirmed, and settled the great charter and charter of forests. 2. He gave a mortal wound to the encroachments of the Pope and his clergy by limiting and establishing the bounds of ecclesiastical jurisdiction, and by obliging the ordinary to whom all the goods of intestates at that time belonged to discharge the debts of the deceased. 3. He defined the limits of the several temporal courts of the highest jurisdiction, those of the king's bench, common pleas, and exchequer, so as they might not interfere with each other's proper business, to do which they must now have recourse to a fiction very necessary and beneficial in the present enlarged state of property. Or, he settled the boundaries of the inferior courts in counties, hundreds, and manors, confining them to causes of no great amount according to their primitive institution, though of considerably greater than by the alteration of the value of money they are now permitted to determine. 5. He secured the property of the subject by abolishing all arbitrary taxes and talliages levied without consent of the National Council. 6. 
He guarded the common justice of the kingdom from abuses by giving up the royal prerogative of sending mandates to interfere in private causes. 7. He settled the form, solemnities, and effects of fines levied in the court of common pleas, though the thing itself was of Saxon original. 8. He first established a repository for the public records of the kingdom few of which are ancienter than the reign of his father, and those were by him collected. 9. He improved upon the laws of King Alfred by that great and orderly method of watch and ward for preserving the public peace and preventing robberies established by the statute of Winchester. 10. He settled and reformed many abuses incident to tenures and removed some restraints on the alienation of landed property by the statute of Chia M. Torres. 11. He instituted a speedier way for the recovery of debts by granting execution not only upon goods and chattels but also upon lands by writ of elegit which was of signal benefit to a trading people, and upon the same commercial ideas he also allowed the charging of lands in a statute merchant to pay debts contracted in trade contrary to all feudal principles. 12. He effectually provided for the recovery of advowsons as temporal rights, in which, before, the law was extremely deficient. 13. He also effectually closed the great gulf in which all the landed property of the kingdom was in danger of being swallowed by his reiterated statutes of Mortmain, most admirably adapted to meet the frauds that had then been devised, though afterwards contrived to be evaded by the invention of uses. 14. He established a new limitation of property by the creation of a state's tale, concerning the good policy of which modern times have, however, entertained a very different opinion. 15. He reduced all Wales to the subjection, not only of the crown, but in great measure, of the laws of England, which was thoroughly completed in the reign of Henry the Eighth and seems to have entertained the design of doing the like by Scotland, so as to have formed an entire and complete union of the island of Great Britain. I might continue this catalogue much farther, but upon the whole we may observe that the very scheme and model of the administration of common justice between party and party was entirely settled by this king, and has continued nearly the same in all succeeding ages to this day, abating some few alterations which the humor or necessity of subsequent times hath occasioned. The form of writs by which actions are commenced were perfected in his reign and established as models for posterity. The pleadings consequent upon the writs were then short, nervous, and perspicuous, not intricate, verbose, and formal. The legal treatises written in his time as Britain, Fleta, Hangham, and the rest are for the most part law at this day, or at least were so, till the alteration of tenures took place. And to conclude, it is from this period, from the exact observation of Magna Carta, rather than from its making or renewal, in the days of his grandfather and father, that the liberty of Englishmen began again to rear its head, though the weight of the military tenures hung heavy upon it for many ages after. I cannot give a better proof of the excellence of his constitutions than that from his time to that of Henry the Eighth, there happened very few, and those not very considerable, alterations in the legal forms of proceedings. As to the matter of substance, the old Gothic powers of electing the principal subordinate magistrates, the sheriffs, and conservators of the peace were taken from the people in the reigns of Edward II and Edward III, and justices of the peace were established instead of the latter. In the reign also of Edward III, the Parliament is supposed most probably to have assumed its present form by a separation of the commons from the lords. The statute for defining and ascertaining treasons was one of the first productions of this new modeled assembly, and the translation of the law proceedings from French into Latin another. 
Much also was done under the auspices of this magnanimous prince for establishing our domestic manufactures by prohibiting the exportation of English wool and the importation or wear of foreign cloth or furs and by encouraging cloth workers from other countries to settle here. Nor was the legislature inattentive to many other branches of commerce or indeed to commerce in general, for in particular it enlarged the credit of the merchant by introducing the statute staple whereby he might the more readily pledge his lands for the security of his mercantile debts and as personal property now grew by the extension of trade to be much more considerable than formerly care was taken in case of intestacies to appoint administrators particularly nominated by the law to distribute that personal property among the creditors and kindred of the deceased which before had been usually applied by the officers of the ordinary to uses then denominated pious the statutes also of primonary for effectually depressing the civil power of the pope were the work of this and the subsequent reign and the establishment of a laborious parochial clergy by the endowment of vicarages out of the overgrown possessions of the monasteries added luster to the close of the fourteenth century though the seeds of the general reformation which were thereby first sown in the kingdom were almost overwhelmed by the spirit of persecution introduced into the laws of the land by the influence of the regular clergy from this time to that of Henry the Seventh, the civil wars and disputed titles to the crown gave no leisure for farther judicial improvement, nam silent legis inter arma, and yet it is to these very disputes that we owe the happy loss of all the dominions of the crown on the continent of France, which turned the minds of our subsequent princes entirely to domestic concerns. To these likewise we owe the method of barring entails by the fiction of common recoveries, invented originally by the clergy to evade the statutes of Mortmain, but introduced under Edward the Fourth for the purpose of unfettering estates and making them more liable to forfeiture, while on the other hand the owners endeavored to protect them by the universal establishment of uses, another of the clerical inventions. In the reign of King Henry the Seventh, his ministers, not to say the king himself, were more industrious in hunting out prosecutions upon old and forgotten penal laws in order to extort money from the subject than in framing any new beneficial regulations. For the distinguishing character of this reign was that of amassing treasure into the king's coffers by every means that could be devised, and almost every alteration in the laws, however salutary or otherwise in their future consequences, had this and this only for their great and immediate object. To this end, the court of Star Chamber was new modeled and armed with powers the most dangerous and unconstitutional over the persons and properties of the subject informations were allowed to be received in lieu of indictments at the assizes and sessions of the peace in order to multiply fines and pecuniary penalties the statute of fines for landed property was craftily and covertly contrived to facilitate the destruction of entails and make the owners of real estates more capable to forfeit as well as to alien the benefit of clergy which so often intervened to stop attainders and save the inheritance, was now allowed only once to lay offenders who only could have inheritances to lose. A writ of copyists was permitted in all actions on the case, and the defendant might in consequence be outlawed, because upon such outlawry his goods became the property of the crown. In short, there is hardly a statute in this reign introductive of a new law or modifying the old, but what either directly or obliquely tended to the emolument of the exchequer. 4. This brings us to the fourth period of our legal history, viz. the reformation of religion under Henry the Eighth and his children, which opens an entirely new scene in ecclesiastical matters, the usurped power of the Pope being now forever routed and destroyed, 
all his connections with this island cut off, the crown restored to its supremacy over spiritual men and causes, and the patronage of bishoprics being once more indisputably vested in the king. And had the spiritual courts been at this time reunited to the civil, we should have seen the old Saxon constitution with regard to ecclesiastical polity completely restored. With regard also to our civil polity, the statute of wills and the statute of uses, both passed in the reign of this prince, made a great alteration as to property, the former by allowing the devise of real estates by will, which before was in general forbidden, the latter by endeavoring to destroy the intricate nicety of uses, though the narrowness and pedantry of the courts of common law prevented this statute from having its full beneficial effect. And thence the court of equity assumed the jurisdiction dictated by common justice and common sense, which, however arbitrarily exercised or productive of jealousies in its infancy, has at length been matured into a most elegant system of rational jurisprudence, the principles of which, notwithstanding they may differ in forms, are now equally adopted by the courts both of law and equity. From the statute of uses and another statute of the same antiquity, which protected his states for years from being destroyed by the reversioner, a remarkable alteration took place in the mode of conveyancing, the ancient assurance by fiefment and livery upon the land being now very seldom practiced since the more easy and more private invention of transferring property by secret conveyances to uses and long terms of years being now continually created in mortgages and family settlements which may be molded to a thousand useful purposes by the ingenuity of an able artist. The farther attacks in this reign upon the immunity of a state's tale, which reduced them to little more than the conditional fees at the common law before the passing of the Statute de Donis, the establishment of recognizances in the nature of a statute staple for facilitating the raising of money upon landed security and the introduction of the bankrupt laws as well for the punishment of the fraudulent as the relief of the unfortunate trader all these were capital alterations of our legal polity and highly convenient to that character which the english now began to reassume of a great commercial people the incorporation of Wales with England and the more uniform administration of justice by destroying some counties palatine and abridging the unreasonable privileges of such as remained added dignity and strength to the monarchy, and together with the numerous improvements before observed upon and the redress of many grievances and oppressions which had been introduced by his father will ever make the administration of Henry the Eighth a very distinct era in the annals of judicial history. It must, however, be remarked that, particularly in his later years, the royal prerogative was then strained to a very tyrannical and oppressive height, and what was the worst circumstance, its encroachments were established by law under the sanction of those pusillanimous parliaments, one of which, to its eternal disgrace, passed a statute whereby it was enacted that the king's proclamations should have the force of acts of parliament, and others concurred in the creation of that amazing heap of wild and newfangled treasons which were slightly touched upon in the former chapter. Happily for the nation, this arbitrary reign was succeeded by the minority of an amiable prince, during the short sunshine of which great part of these extravagant laws were repealed. And to do justice to the shorter reign of Queen Mary, many salutary and popular laws in civil matters were made under her administration, perhaps the better to reconcile the people to the bloody measures which she was induced to pursue for the re-establishment of religious slavery, the well-concerted schemes for effecting which were, through the providence of God, defeated by the seasonable accession of Queen Elizabeth. The religious liberties of the nation being, by that happy event, established, we trust, on an eternal basis, though obliged in their infancy to be guarded against papists and other nonconformists by laws of too sanguinary a nature, 
the forest laws having fallen into disuse and the administration of civil right in the courts of justice being carried on in a regular course according to the wise institutions of King Edward I without any material innovations, all the principal grievances introduced by the Norman conquest seem to have been gradually shaken off and our Saxon constitution restored with considerable improvements except only in the continuation of military tenures and a few other points which still arm the crown with a very oppressive and dangerous prerogative. It is also to be remarked that the spirit of enriching the clergy and endowing religious houses had, through the former abuse of it, gone over to such a contrary extreme, and the princes of the House of Tudor and their favorites had fallen with such avidity upon the spoils of the church that a decent and honorable maintenance was wanting to many of the bishops and clergy. This produced the restraining statutes to prevent the alienations of lands and tithes belonging to the church and universities, the number of indigent persons being also greatly increased by withdrawing the alms of the monasteries. A plan was formed in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, more humane and beneficial than even feeding and clothing of millions, by affording them the means, with proper industry, to feed and clothe themselves and the farther any subsequent plans for maintaining the poor have departed from this institution, the more impracticable and even pernicious their visionary attempts have proved. However, considering the reign of Queen Elizabeth in a great and political view, we have no reason to regret many subsequent alterations in the English Constitution. For though in general she was a wise and excellent princess and loved her people, Though in her time trade flourished, riches increased, the laws were duly administrated, the nation was respected abroad, and the people happy at home, yet the increase of the power of the Star Chamber and the erection of the High Commission Court in matters ecclesiastical were the work of her reign. She also kept her parliaments at a very awful distance, and in many particulars she, at times, would carry the prerogative as high as her most arbitrary predecessors. It is true, she very seldom exerted this prerogative so as to oppress individuals, but still she had it to exert, and therefore the felicity of her reign depended more on her want of opportunity and inclination than want of power to play the tyrant. This is a high enconium on her merit, but at the same time is sufficient to show that these were not the golden days of genuine liberty that we formerly were taught to believe, for surely the true liberty of the subject consists not so much in the gracious behavior as in the limited power of the sovereign. End of chapter the 33rd, part 3. Chapter 33, Part 4 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Fourth of Public Wrongs by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Chapter the 33rd of the Rise, Progress, and Gradual Improvements of the Laws of England. Part 4. The great revolutions that had happened in manners and in property had paved the way by imperceptible yet sure degrees for as great a revolution in government. Yet while that revolution was effecting, the crown became more arbitrary than ever by the progress of those very means which afterwards reduced its power. It is obvious to every observer that till the close of the Lancastrian civil wars, the property and the power of the nation were chiefly divided between the king, the nobility, and the clergy. The commons were generally in a state of great ignorance, their personal wealth before the extension of trade was comparatively small, and the nature of their landed property was such as kept them in continual dependence upon their feudal lord, being usually some powerful baron, some opulent abbey, or sometimes the king himself. 
though a notion of general liberty had strongly pervaded and animated the whole constitution, yet the particular liberty, the natural equality, and personal independence of individuals were little regarded or thought of, nay, even to assert them was treated as the height of sedition and rebellion. Our ancestors heard with detestation and horror those sentiments rudely delivered and pushed to most absurd extremes by the violence of a Cade and a Tyler, which have since been applauded with the zeal almost rising to idolatry, when softened and recommended by the eloquence, the moderation, and the arguments of a Sidney, a Locke, and a Milton. But when learning, by the invention of printing and the progress of religious reformation began to be universally disseminated, when trade and navigation were suddenly carried to an amazing extent by the use of the compass and the consequent discovery of the Indies, the minds of men thus enlightened by science and enlarged by observation and travel began to entertain a more just opinion of the dignity and rights of mankind. An inundation of wealth flowed in upon the merchants and middling rank, while the two great estates of the kingdom, which formerly had balanced the prerogative, the nobility and the clergy, were greatly impoverished and weakened. The popish clergy, detected in their frauds and abuses, exposed to the resentment of the populace, and stripped of their lands and revenues, stood trembling for their very existence. The nobles, enervated by the refinements of luxury, which knowledge, foreign travel, and the progress of the politer arts are too apt to introduce with themselves, and fired with disdain at being rivaled in magnificence by the opulent citizens, fell into enormous expenses, to gratify which they were permitted by the policy of the times to dissipate their overgrown estates and alienate their ancient patrimonies. This gradually reduced their power and their influence within a very moderate bound, while the king, by the spoil of the monasteries and the great increase of the customs, grew rich, independent, and haughty, and the commons were not yet sensible of the strength they had acquired, nor urged to examine its extent by new burthens or impressive taxations during the sudden opulence of the exchequer. Intent upon acquiring new riches, and happy in being freed from the insolence and tyranny of the orders more immediately above them, they never dreamt of opposing the prerogative to which they had been so little accustomed, much less of taking the lead in opposition to which by their weight and their property they were now entitled. The latter years of Henry the Eighth were therefore the times of the greatest despotism that have been known in this island since the death of William the Norman. The prerogative, as it then stood by common law, and much more when extended by act of Parliament, being too large to be endured in a land of liberty. Queen Elizabeth and the intermediate princes of the Tudor line had almost the same legal powers and sometimes exerted them as roughly as their father, King Henry VIII. But the critical situation of that princess with regard to her legitimacy, her religion, her enmity with Spain, and her jealousy of the Queen of Scots occasioned greater caution in her conduct. She probably, or her able advisers, had penetration enough to discern how the power of the kingdom had gradually shifted its channel, and wisdom enough not to provoke the commons to discover and feel their strength. She therefore drew a veil over the odious part of prerogative, which was never wantonly thrown aside, but only to answer some important purpose, and though the royal treasury no longer overflowed with the wealth of the clergy, which had been all granted out, and had contributed to enrich the people, she asked for supplies with such moderation, and managed them with so much economy, that the commons were happy in obliging her. Such, in short, were her circumstances, her necessities, her wisdom, and her good disposition, that never did a prince so long and so entirely for the space of half a century together reign in the affections of the people. On the accession of King James I, no new degree of royal power was added to or exercised by him, but such a scepter was too weighty to be wielded by such a hand. 
the unreasonable and imprudent exertion of what was then deemed to be prerogative upon trivial and unworthy occasions, and the claim of a more absolute power inherent in the kingly office than had ever been carried into practice soon awakened the sleeping lion. The people heard with astonishment doctrines preached from the throne and the pulpit, subversive of liberty and property and all the natural rights of humanity. They examined into the divinity of this claim and found it weakly and fallaciously supported, and common reason assured them that if it were of human origin, no constitution could establish it without power of revocation, no precedent could sanctify, no length of time could confirm it. The leaders felt the pulse of the nation and found they had ability as well as inclination to resist it and accordingly resisted and opposed it whenever the pusillanimous temper of the reigning monarch had courage to put it to trial, and they gained some little victories in the cases of concealments, monopolies, and the dispensing power. In the meantime, very little was done for the improvement of private justice except the abolition of sanctuaries and the extension of the bankrupt laws, the limitation of suits and actions, and the regulating of informations upon penal statutes. For I cannot class the laws against witchcraft and conjuration under the head of improvements, nor did the dispute between Lord Ellesmere and Sir Edward Coke concerning the powers of the Court of Chancery tend much to the advancement of justice. Indeed, when Charles I succeeded to the crown of his father and attempted to revive some enormities which had been dormant in the reign of King James, the loans and benevolences extorted from the subject, the arbitrary imprisonments for refusal, the exertion of martial law in time of peace, and other domestic grievances, clouded the morning of that misguided prince's reign, which though the noon of it began a little to brighten, at last went down in blood and left the whole kingdom in darkness. It must be acknowledged that, by the petition of right enacted to abolish these encroachments, the English constitution received great alteration and improvement. But there still remained the latent power of the forest laws which the crown most unseasonably revived. The legal jurisdiction of the Star Chamber and High Commission courts was also extremely great, though their usurped authority was still greater. And if we add to these the disuse of parliaments, the ill-timed zeal and despotic proceedings of the ecclesiastical governors in matters of mere indifference, together with the arbitrary levies of tonnage and poundage, ship money, and other projects, we may see grounds most amply sufficient for seeking redress in a legal constitutional way. This redress, when fought, was also constitutionally given, for all these oppressions were actually abolished by the king in Parliament before the rebellion broke out by the several statutes for triennial parliaments for abolishing the Star Chamber and High Commission Courts, for ascertaining the extent of forests and forest laws, for renouncing ship money and other exactions, and for giving up the prerogative of knighting the king's tenants in capite in consequence of their feudal tenures, though it must be acknowledged that these concessions were not made with so good a grace as to conciliate the confidence of the people. Unfortunately, either by his own mismanagement or by the arts of his enemies, the king had lost the reputation of sincerity, which is the greatest unhappiness that can befall a prince. Though he formerly had strained his prerogative not only beyond what the genius of the present times would bear, but also beyond the example of former ages, he had now consented to reduce it to a lower ebb than was consistent with monarchical government. A conduct so opposite to his temper and principles, joined with some rash actions and unguarded expressions, made the people suspect that this condescension was merely temporary. Flushed, therefore, with the success they had gained, fired with resentment for past oppressions, and dreading the consequences if the king should regain his power, the popular leaders, who in all ages have called themselves the people, began to grow insolent and ungovernable, their insolence soon rendered them desperate. 
and despair at length forced them to join with a set of military hypocrites and enthusiasts who overturned the church and monarchy and proceeded with deliberate solemnity to the trial and murder of their sovereign. I pass by the crude and abortive schemes for amending the laws in the times of confusion which followed, the most promising and sensible whereof, such as the establishment of new trials, the abolition of feudal tenures, the act of navigation, and some others, were adopted in the 5. Fifth period, which I am next to mention, viz. after the restoration of King Charles II immediately upon which the principal remaining grievance, the doctrine and consequences of military tenures, were taken away and abolished, except in the instance of corruption of inheritable blood upon attainder of treason and felony. And though the monarch, in whose person the royal government was restored, and with it our ancient constitution, deserves no commendation from posterity, yet in his reign, wicked, sanguinary, and turbulent as it was, the concurrence of happy circumstances was such that from thence we may date not only the re-establishment of our church and monarchy, but also the complete restitution of English liberty for the first time since its total abolition at the conquest. For therein, not only these slavish tenures, the badge of foreign dominion, with all their oppressive appendages, were removed from encumbering the estates of the subject, but also an additional security of his person from imprisonment was obtained by that great bulwark of our Constitution, the Habeas Corpus Act. These two statutes, with regard to our property and persons, form a second Magna Carta as beneficial and effectual as that of Runningmede. That only pruned the luxuriances of the feudal system, but the statute of Charles II extirpated all its slaveries except perhaps in copyhold tenure, and there also they are now in great measure enervated by gradual custom and the interposition of our courts of justice. Magna Carta only, in general terms, declared that no man shall be imprisoned contrary to law. The Habeas Corpus Act points him out effectual means as well to release himself, though committed even by the king in council, as to punish all those who shall thus unconstitutionally misuse him. To these I may add the abolition of the prerogatives of purveyance and preemption, the statute for holding triennial parliaments, the Test and Corporation Acts, which secure both our civil and religious liberties, the abolition of the writ de heretico comborendo, the statute of frauds and perjuries, a great and necessary security to private property, the statute for distribution of intestates estates, and that of amendments and geophiles, which cut off those superfluous niceties which so long had disgraced our courts, together with many other wholesome acts that were passed in this reign for the benefit of navigation and the improvement of foreign commerce, and the whole, when we likewise consider the freedom from taxes and armies which the subject then enjoyed, will be sufficient to demonstrate this truth that the Constitution of England had arrived to its full vigor, and the true balance between liberty and prerogative was happily established by law in the reign of King Charles II. It is far from my intention to palliate or defend many very iniquitous proceedings contrary to all law in that reign through the artifice of wicked politicians both in and out of employment. What seems incontestable is this that by the law as it then stood, notwithstanding some invidious, nay dangerous, branches of the prerogative have since been lopped off, and the rest more clearly defined, the people had as large a portion of real liberty as is consistent with a state of society and sufficient power residing in their own hands to assert and preserve that liberty if invaded by the royal prerogative for which I need but appeal to the memorable catastrophe of the next reign, for when King Charles's deluded brother attempted to enslave the nation, he found it was beyond his power. The people both could and did resist him, and in consequence of such resistance obliged him to quit his enterprise and his throne altogether, which introduces us to the last period of our legal history, 
viz. 6. From the Revolution in 1688 to the present time, in this period many laws have passed, as the Bill of Rights, the Toleration Act, the Act of Settlement with its conditions, the Act for Uniting England with Scotland, and some others, which have asserted our liberties in more clear and emphatical terms, have regulated the succession of the Crown by Parliament as the exigencies of religious and civil freedom required, have confirmed and exemplified the doctrine of resistance when the executive magistrate endeavors to subvert the Constitution, have maintained the superiority of the laws above the king by pronouncing his dispensing power to be illegal, have indulged tender consciences with every religious liberty consistent with the safety of the state, have established triennial, since turned into septennial, elections of members to serve in Parliament, have excluded certain officers from the House of Commons, have restrained the King's pardon from obstructing parliamentary impeachments, have imparted to all the Lords an equal right of trying their fellow peers, have regulated trials for high treason, have afforded our posterity a hope that corruption of blood may one day be abolished and forgotten, have by the desire of his present majesty, set bounds to the civil list and place the administration of that revenue in hands that are accountable to Parliament, and have, by the like desire, made the judges completely independent of the king, his ministers, and his successors. Yet though these provisions have, in appearance and nominally, reduced the strength of the executive power to a much lower ebb than in the preceding period, If, on the other hand, we throw into the opposite scale what perhaps the immoderate reduction of the ancient prerogative may have rendered in some degree necessary, the vast acquisition of force arising from the Riot Act and the annual expedience of a standing army and the vast acquisition of personal attachment arising from the magnitude of the national debt and the manner of levying those yearly millions that are appropriated to pay the interest we shall find that the crown has, gradually and imperceptibly, gained almost as much in influence as it apparently lost in prerogative. The chief alterations of moment, for the time would fail me to descend to minutia, and the administration of private justice during this period are the solemn recognition of the law of nations with respect to the rights of ambassadors, the cutting off by the statute for the amendment of the law, a vast number of excrescences that in process of time had sprung out of that practical part of it, the protection of corporate rights by the improvements in writs of mandamus and informations in nature of quo warranto, the regulations of trials by jury and the admitting witnesses for prisoners upon oath, the farther restraints upon alienation of lands in Mortmain, the extension of the benefit of clergy by abolishing the pedantic criterion of reading, the counterbalance to this mercy by the vast increase of capital punishment, the new and effectual methods for the speedy recovery of rents, the improvements which have been made in ejectments for the trying of titles, the introduction and establishment of paper credit by endorsements upon bills and notes which have shown the possibility, so long doubted, of assigning a chosen action, the translation of all legal proceedings into the English language, the erection of courts of conscience for recovering small debts, and, which is much the better plan, the reformation of county courts, the great system of marine jurisprudence of which the foundations have been laid by clearly developing the principles on which policies of insurance are founded and by happily applying those principles to particular cases, and lastly, the liberality of sentiment which, though late, has now taken possession of our courts of common law and induced them to adopt, where facts can clearly be ascertained, the same principles of redress as have prevailed in our courts of equity from the time that Lord Nottingham presided there, and this not only were specially empowered by particular statutes, as in the case of bonds, mortgages, and set-offs, 
but by extending the remedial influence of the equitable writ of trespass on the case according to its primitive institution by King Edward I to almost every instance of injustice not remedied by any other process. And these, I think, are all the material alterations that have happened with respect to private justice in the course of the present century. Thus, therefore, for the amusement and instruction of the student, I have endeavored to delineate some rude outlines of a plan for the history of our laws and liberties, from their first rise and gradual progress among our British and Saxon ancestors till their total eclipse at the Norman conquest, from which they have gradually emerged and risen to the perfection they now enjoy at different periods of time. We have seen in the course of our inquiries, in this and in the former volumes, that the fundamental maxims and rules of the law which regard the rights of persons and the rights of things, the private injuries that may be offered to both, and the crimes which affect the public, have been and are at every day improving, and are now fraught with the accumulated wisdom of the ages, that the forms of administering justice came to perfection under Edward I, and that have not been much varied, nor always for the better, since that our religious liberties were fully established at the Reformation, but that the recovery of our civil and political liberties was a work of a longer time, they not being thoroughly and completely regained till after the restoration of King Charles, nor fully and explicitly acknowledged and defined till the era of happy revolution, of a constitution so wisely contrived, so strongly raised, and so highly finished, it is hard to speak with that praise which is justly and severely its due. The thorough and attentive contemplation of it will furnish its best panegyric. It hath been the endeavor of these commentaries, however the execution may have succeeded, to examine its solid foundations, to mark out its extensive plan, to explain the use and distribution of its parts, and from the harmonious concurrence of those several parts to demonstrate the elegant proportion of the whole. We have taken occasion to admire at every turn the noble monuments of ancient simplicity and the more curious refinements of modern art. Nor have its faults been concealed from view. For faults it has, lest we should be tempted to think of it of more than human structure. Defects chiefly arising from the decays of time or the rage of unskillful improvements in later ages. To sustain, to repair, to beautify this noble pile is a charge entrusted principally to the nobility and such gentlemen of the kingdom as are delegated by their country to Parliament. The protection of the liberty of Britain is a duty which they owe to themselves who enjoy it to their ancestors who transmitted it down, and to their posterity who will claim at their hands this, the best birthright and noblest inheritance of mankind. End of chapter the 33rd, part 4. End of book the 4th of Public Wrongs. End of the Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone.